I, I'd like to introduce you Ian Polson. Ian is from a company called Think Insure and they handle the CSSA's insurance. Ian is the guy that sorts out the knots and troubleshoots everything and comes up with great new products and stuff for us. So without any further ado, please welcome Ian. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is the largest audience I've had. My family, I practiced with them on this and they all left the room, so hopefully we'll stay for more than they did. Um, can everybody hear me if I don't use the microphone? Or you prefer the microphone? You, pre you, prefer, you prefer the microphone? Okay, let me raise it up. Say Tony Short. Ooh, that's loud. Um, today we're going to talk about the CSSA's insurance programs. Um, there's two sides to this program. There's the association and the clubs, and then there's the individual members. Uh, can I see a show of hands? How many people are here as directors or officers of a club? Okay. Uh, Judith is handing out what are called the directors and officers uh, face sheet of the coverage or the declaration page. So if you'd hold your hand up while she passes, she'll hand you a copy. Um, if you haven't read your policy or haven't received a copy, that's quite normal. We keep the policies at head office, meaning the CSSA, and we deliver them on request. Uh, the declaration page is just a form of identifying the limits of coverage. As far as the wordings are concerned, uh, you should take the time to uh, call me, not call me, but ask me to mail you a copy of the policy. It's 63 pages. We'll do it by email. And uh, at your leisure, you can read through it. If you need a lawyer to help you read, read the uh, contract, I understand. Uh, we are giving out as uh, audiovisual aids magnifying glasses for the fine print. I had to bring humor into it. <laughs> I was in Las Vegas, and of course, you, you see the magicians and everything like that. So I thought I'd bring a little humor to this. And I, brought a, I bought a set of cards back from Carrots. And the only reason I brought them is the symbolism. And the symbolism is that the world, unfortunately, is a very complicated world. And we sometimes think the world's stacked against us. And so this is just a deck of cards representing the world. We're going to start with the presentation. And the presentation, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. And it's basically a summary of coverages, a summary of concepts, so that you understand as a club and as, an, as a member where you're covered, where you're not covered. And then when we're finished with that, we're going to do a Q&A, and then we're going to have a small video. But before I start, are there any questions that you want answered? Yes, sir. I'd like to know if this insurance is on top of other insurance that you have. Well, this is the principal policy. The principal policy is liability. So if you're referring to another product, uh, give me an example, and I'll answer that question. Car insurance are you talking about, or home insurance? <coughs> Okay, this is the one. This is the one that counts. This is your liability. And let's make sure we understand liability, okay? We're talking about third-party liability. That means you're doing something, an incident occurs, and you're held responsible. So you're out shooting, hunting, or whatever, and you shoot the famous cow in the backfield of the farm. You need liability insurance because of your actions, okay? We're not pain to make you, uh, let's say, uh, emotionally better. It's not for your benefit, it's to protect the public from your actions. The CFO requires all clubs have general liability insurance or they can't operate. So as a condition of having a, a club, you have to have general liability. As a, a member of that club, the club's requirement is that all members must have liability. And if you're a competitive shooter, to go on to a range and compete, most ranges will ask you to provide evidence you have liability insurance. So this is the bedrock or the foundation of the firearms insurance policy, liability. Any questions on that? Do you mind if I go yeah. ahead and then if, you, if I bring up that? Yes, sir. If, if we have a guest that we bring into a club, yes. uh, are they covered under our uh, individual policy or do we have to leave money at the club it, for their... Oh, okay, the question is, as a shooter, you bring a friend with you to your club, or a, not your club, but a third, was that me or somebody's phone? I'm going to ask everybody to turn their phones off. I just realized I might have left mine on, and I've got mine off. Let's do one thing at a time. We'll start with your club. You invite a friend to come to your club. 
your club is a c s s a club you are a c s s a member is your guest going to be covered under that policy the answer is yes subject to the definition of a guest by that club so if for instance the policy of the club is to allow you to have guests then yes that person would be covered the definition of a guest which I've been told by most club is limited so for example they can't go for a year and call themselves a guest coming every week it might be limited to three times it might be limited to until they've gone through a probationary period they're called a guest okay going back to the question though if you went to a non CSSA club is that guest covered I couldn't answer that because the policy of that club may be different than the policy of the CSSA so yes you're covered at that club and one of the things we'll mention and you're actually taking some of my wind out of my sails here but thanks for asking the question and if you have any other that you want to elaborate on I'll answer them later we're going to start with the present with the presentation and you can see that uh, I have to move this first of all the CSSA is partners we call them partners with us because when an insurance company insures someone it's not them taking on the risk it's them sharing the risk when you give them money you're giving them consideration and for that consideration they're taking on the risk you're transferring some of that risk but not all of that risk due diligence protocol policies that's your responsibility but as far as a claim is concerned we're going to take on the responsibility of the claim up to the limit of the policy Uh, just a little bit about myself just so you know who I am I've been in the industry now for 38 years I think it's coming up to 40 and I've been in every single line of insurance and I've sold almost every single kind of policy ever made and we keep making new policies so I figure I've got another 40 years I can work in this industry we're going to talk about what's called the firearm and the insurance dilemma the association the boards the clubs <coughs> the members and the instructors the individual versus the entity um, individuals that are part of the CSA, I found they can be instructors, they can be teaching hunter safety, they can be uh, teaching POW, but I've found there's literally hundreds, if not more, instructors that teach things that are outside of the defined safety courses. And people that are self employed and do teach that course or any other course, and I'm not talking about POW or hunter safety, should seriously consider having liability. First, personally, if they're going to go to a range and bring other people onto that range, they're liable for their actions and the actions of the people that they bring with them. If they don't have a liability policy, someone's going to be uh, responsible for any damages, and it's usually the instructor. Uh, the third point, the insurance puzzle. I think the comment was made by the gentleman in the corner in the back when he first started speaking and he said, is this secondary, primary, or is this multiple layers of insurance? The answer is, you're right on everything. When a person buys a car, they buy a car policy. Uh, a lot of people don't buy a car policy because they think it's voluntary. It's not voluntary. It's mandatory. And so we buy it. And it's fairly expensive and it's getting more expensive. But we also have home insurance and the question then is well why can't our home policy protect us as a firearm owners and the answer it does in certain circumstances but it's limited it's limited by the fact that it's tied to your home policy it's limited by the fact it has a deductible it's limited by the fact the coverage might only be a million dollars uh, your association has taken the forward thinking to have a minimum five million dollars coverage and of course you're going to ask the question later on how do the two react or work together and the answer is they do work together one may be exhausted and the other comes in the fact that you've got five million means that up until five million you're not going to have to worry about a claim personally the fourth point the responsible firearm owner the purpose of a liability policy associated to the use of firearm is to act quickly to mitigate a loss primarily when an incident is first reported or a civil suit is made what we're referring to here is like when do you make a claim when do you notify the insurance company and in our handouts today I've given you what's called a claim form I do not want to see these claim forms I just want you to have them in your little briefcase somewhere and I hope they never come out but the purpose of that claim form is so that when an incident occurs you report it immediately to the powers above you in that form you'll see there's a fax number and an email address that you can send the form in do not worry 
If a minor incident doesn't turn any, into anything, still send it in. We'll keep it on file. Because the definition of insurance is we only cover you if we know about it during a certain time period. Usually it's the policy period or in what's called occurrence-based policies, the policy that was in force at the time of the incident. So if you don't report it and two years later someone sues you, that's the statute of limitations, I think, is two years. Is Ed in the room, by the way? He's not here. Good. Okay, any more lawyers in the room? <laughs> Sorry, Ed. Are there any other lawyers in the room, just so I know I can be on my toes when I say? Okay. Okay, fine. I'm only kidding. In fact, um, I understand you have a legal, uh, what's it called, legal defense policy, and I understand there's a call service. Am I right? Okay. The call service means if you're ever in doubt about something, you can always call them, and they're very good at answering your questions. It may not involve a lawyer. In fact, yesterday... I called legal defense, uh, sorry, it was not this particular purpose, it was another purpose, and it was regarding a lawyer's bill. And we're going to deviate just for a second, and uh, it was a wrongful dismissal suit, and the action had been taken three years ago, and the lawyer forgot to bill us. Three years later, he sends us the bill, and uh, we're looking at the bill and we're saying, geez, why the heck did they send it so late? Then we went on the internet and we found out the statute of limitations for accounts receivable is three years. Phone back, at, we phoned legal defense, just so you know. And uh, they gave us the information that according to the statutes, I didn't have to pay the bill. The moral of the story, it paid for the service, it paid for the insurance, and all I'm saying is it's always nice to have a lawyer to talk to, even if you don't get them involved in a civil suit, or even a criminal suit. And it's available through the association, I understand. The question is, we act immediately. So you do send us that form. We just don't put it in the round filing cabinet. We actually put it on the computer so that if something happens in the future, we've got a statement from you. We can't get a statement three years from now that's accurate. We forget things. Who's your witness? How do you get in touch with the witness, etc. Okay, according to the CGL, what is covered? And the key words are CSA sanctioned firearm activities, hunting, fishing, I, I, I forgot to put archery up there, uh, anything related to the firearms industry. There are a couple exclusions. I think one of them was the um, cowboy action riding a horse or something like that. The cowboy action itself is not excluded, but riding the horse is. I think it was the uh, SPCA that told us we shouldn't be doing things like that. Um, where are you covered? Worldwide. Very important. I've had people coming from England to Canada, and they've been buying the insurance so they can shoot in Canada. And I said, why are you doing that? He, Aren't you covered in England? He says, yeah, but you know what? I'd rather be safe than sorry. So yes, they've duplicated benefits, but at least they've got this coverage. The action, meaning the court action, has to occur in Canada, though. And when are you covered? 24-7. I don't know how many of you shoot at 2 in the morning, but according to the policy, you're covered 24-7. And if I don't knock over the speaker, I'll be fine. The microphone. Uh, the homeowner's policy versus the entity versus the activity. First of all, a homeowner's policy does not cover a club. Makes sense? Because it's a separate entity. Now, I'm going to caution the directors here. I've run into a few clubs where they own property in a different name. For example, ABC Investment Company, a division of such and such. We don't cover commercial activities. We only cover the club activities. So if you do have additional investment property, um, I, I, I'll give you other examples later, you should identify that to us so we can at least tell you you're not covered for that commercial activity. Uh, shootovers, if the shootover is not in the name of the club, but in a numbered company, and some lawyers, where's that? Sorry, it may suggest- a shoot, a, a shoot over, if it's beyond your property, you buy the adjacent property so that if there's any, sorry, the question is, what's a shoot over? You guys know what it is, come on. I'm using the wrong well, term. Insurance term we're talking about. No, what we're talking about is if you bought additional property like a farm adjacent to your range so that no one can complain about noise or if there's a, a, a shot that goes beyond the bunker. Does anybody disagree with that? Yep. It happens, people do buy that. But I have had clubs run into <coughs> problems where they've been sued by members for the valuation of their club. And the problem is there's two entities now. We've got an investment club and we've got the range. The range is not for profit. The uh, property is an investment property. And if someone said, what's the value of your club? What's the fair market value? It's not zero. Okay, I won't get into specifics because you probably know the situations. 
Um, what is DNO? Why have it? The board is the bottom line, the decision makers. What is negligence versus intentional act? This is extremely important now. I'm going to really be tough on the board here. I ran into a situation where a board asked me to quote on their property. And the property hadn't been appraised for about 20 years. I'm talking about the buildings, the range, equipment, and everything. And the question was, do we have replacement value? And I'll put in some numbers. The value of the insurance policy on the property was about 250000 After doing an appraisal on the property, which the insurance industry uses, it's called total insurance value, we came out with a million dollars. Now, you would think they'd be happy. They've got a range that's worth a million dollars instead of two fifty. what it said on their policy. Anyone know what I'm talking about when I talk about the value of your property? Don't look at me like that. Okay, what I'm trying to do is not sell you insurance, is to make sure you understand the word of your property coverage. We're off liability, but it's going to tie into the director's liability. They chose not to insure it for a million. Can anyone tell me if that was negligence or an intentional act? If it's an intentional act, the board has committed a crime. Now, will they go to jail? I don't think so. But I'm a shareholder, or I'm a member in the club, and I pay my membership. At the end of the year, the place burns down, and the club says, you know what, we lost 750,000. Oh gosh, let's sue the agent. No, we've got an intentional act by the board, and the insurance policy won't pay, okay? We're not, gonna, first of all, Going back to the fire insurance policy, if it's with me, I obviously am going to warn you and caution you and explain the significance. But if you're with another agent or a broker or a company and they haven't informed you that you do not have replacement value, it can say re replacement, by the way. Anywhere on the policy, it can say replacement. You, are not, you do not have replacement value unless you're insured to total insurance value or replacement value for today's values. Now, the big problem with older ranges is the older rangers have old equipment. They don't know what to insure it for. And I say, well, let's get a company in to do a rebuilding and figure out what it costs to rebuild your range. That's the type of policy you should have. We won't give you replacement value because we're not gonna replace it. We're gonna give you an actual cash value and you have to speak to your membership and say, look, we've got a discrepancy. We've gotta fix that discrepancy. And again, it goes back to the board of directors, the decision makers, okay? Policy and procedures, membership reporting claims. Um, I was told when I first got involved with the CSSA that you're one of the most organized groups out there. That a pin couldn't fall on the floor and somebody wouldn't notice it. The truth of the matter is, policy and procedures, what I'm referring to here is how a member can join, how a member can be dismissed, and what are the repercussions. The claims we've got over the last 10 years have included Wrongful dismissal. Now, wrongful dismissal, most people think of an employer-employee relationship. But when you have a member who's disgruntled, they tend to get upset because under the Firearms Act, or you, you, ha you can't transport your handgun without being a member of a club. Am I right? Sort of. Sort, sort of. of. Well, I'm 50-50. I know it's changed a little bit. <coughs> you can only shoot at a club. It doesn't say you have to belong to the club. Okay, fair enough. But most clubs, if you're going to be a member, you have to be a member in good standing. Am I right? So it is reasonable to get upset if you've been dismissed by a club. So it's reasonable that the member is going to go to the board of directors and ask for either an acquittal, or not an acquittal, but a, an appeal. So you have to have protocols and procedures in place to handle these situations because the insurance company is going to say, under the directors and officers, we're not paying. The reason is, you're not an employee, okay, you're a member. But they do come to the general liability policy and say, I've suffered bodily injury, I'm traumatized because I lost my membership, and we are paying claims, and they're significant claims, okay? We're talking six-figure <coughs> claims. Um, private ranges and claims to date, samples of where? Okay, does anyone uh, have their own personal range? Well, believe it or not, the CSSA, we, we insure quite a few. And the reason I mention it is because when we talk to people about what association you want to be associated with, I believe there's value in them all. I'm sorry, Tony, wherever you are. 
but i also believe the c s a has things that a lot of associations don't have and that's a broad spectrum of additional coverages for policies and one of them is private clubs so if you do know someone that has a farm and they've set up a bunker and they're using handguns then they should have a private policy and the CFO is out there looking for them because I was called up by the CFO uh, to solve a problem where people couldn't get insurance from their homeowners and the people that were calling their homeowners policy were being told we don't want to insure you anymore if you have a private range so we do offer that and I just want you to be aware of it uh, have we had any claims no not on the private range and it's very very cheap I shouldn't say cheap, yeah. cost effective. <laughs> okay, uh, by the way, I did send out a little list. <coughs> Judith, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> There's a list, uh, it's a, it's over where is it? Over there. over there, okay, hang on one second. If there's any product information you want or a handout, you can just put your name, you can put your name and your email or your phone number and I'll contact you and if it's something you can write down what you want, I'll send it to you. Um, in your handout, there's what's called the best practices for risk management for hunting activities. Most of you, are, how many in the room are hunters? Show of hands? Okay, at least 50%. So 50% of you are out there shooting on someone else's property, if not your own, am I right? Okay. Am I, gonna, am I right to say this? Half the time you ask the owner of the property, can I shoot on your land? Do you ever get a document from the person saying you can? Okay. Well, I'm going to strongly suggest you get a document. I've got the document attached. It's called, oh, sorry, I didn't attach the document. It's called a Hunter's Land Lease. And, no, you don't have it. I don't believe you have it, but I do have it here. Here it is here. Uh, and I will show it to you on the screen. It's called a Hunter's Annual Hunting Lease. And the purpose of this is to develop a good relationship with the, person's pro the person that owns the property you're shooting on because they accidentally take on liability when you enter the property, and unless you indemnify him, he's exposing or she's exposing themselves to tremendous liability if there's an incident that occurs. Um, I had a cousin who worked for the ministry, we won't talk which one, True. environmental, uh, and bottom line, uh, he went out hunting with his buddies, he was six miles in the bush, fell in a, a, a hole, snapped his leg in two places, and had to be airlifted out at a cost of, let's say, 25000 The moral of the story is that if that had been on a farm and it was a gopher hole, I'm not saying the farmer's liable, but you want to make sure you can tell him he's not liable, okay? And it's a little, it's clarification of your position and your respect to the landowner. And also, and this is critical, you sign it as a CSSA member and we're going to indemnify you. We're not indemnifying the non-members, and they have to sign it that they're not. Okay? Good reason to join the CSSA, right? Yeah. Hey. Okay. So if you want a copy of that, just put your name on the list, and we'll send you a copy, and uh, you can give it out to your friends. You can pass it around. Okay. Where are we? <laughs> I don't know what year this picture was taken, but it looks a lot like this group here. When, when you were younger. Uh, what's really interesting about that picture, I don't know if you noticed it or not, about 30% are women. And that's fantastic. Uh, and I don't know what year that was taken, probably in the 50s. And I don't know what the numbers are today, but I bet you they're probably higher or lower. Do we know? Lower. Lower? lower. Really? Dramatic Bad job. Lower. It's turning around. Okay. But there's a good, it was taught in school. I don't know about you, but I came from the time period where it was mandatory to join the cadets and learn how to shoot. Anybody else in that same boat? Yeah, good man. And women. Okay. Actually, it's funny. My wife actually joined the reserves. This is back when we were in university. And she held it over to me because she had a rank higher than I did. <laughs> and I can't Call remember. Called wife. <laughs> <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> okay. What I've done here is a symbol. It's, it's, it's a jigsaw puzzle. And it's important for you not to get upset about the different policies you've got. You've got your auto, you've got your home, you've got your general liability now, your firearms liability. And I don't want you to get upset that you've got overlap. Overlap is necessary. In fact, uh, we use a word called an umbrella. And eventually, uh, if you haven't already done at your homeowner's policy, 
you can actually ask for what's called an umbrella. And that umbrella covers the holes in all your other insurance policies. So when there's something missing, it's covered. We call it an umbrella. We talked about the club liability, and just for your own references, every one of you has a declaration page. We have $5 million of general liability. The deductible is 1000 Now, I want to mention it because there's been criticism <coughs> by some people about what is a deductible and why does it have to be 1000 Why isn't it zero? Or why isn't it 500000 deductible? And the answer is claims. We don't want miscellaneous claims. Anyone that says a low deductible is an advantage is misunderstanding insurance. Remember, we're partners with you. If you aren't going to carry your share, we're not going to be your partner. A low deductible means high frequency claims. High frequency claims means we don't insure you. Um, as you're well aware, in the United States, a very large insurance company that will remain nameless, Chubb, um, canceled a policy because of misunderstanding and publicity, incorrect publicity. Everybody know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Okay, we're not going to go into the details, but it's a demonstration how public persuasion can persuade the insurance companies to go out of an industry. And in Canada, we're totally different than the United States. We have a tremendous network of support here. Uh, it's a sporting industry in Canada. The CSSA is one of your, uh, I, I'm gonna use the word godsends only because I've looked at what has happened over the last 25 years by reading articles about the CSSA and the key people in it, Steve and everybody else. Congratulations. Uh, the work that they've done behind the scenes for the gun owner is unbelievable. And I have a hard time remembering half the things that I've read and how important they are to the firearms industry. And Bill 71, which I'm not trying to be political here today, but uh, is another critical uh, bill that has to be stopped if the firearms owner wants to retain their rights. But also, from a public's perception, my perception, I'm not an owner of a firearm, I have my pal, but I look at Bill 71 as an infrasion, in, in, uh, invasion of my privacy, uh, also taking away my rights. There's another bill that's come out that's gonna have as much effect on you, it's called Bill 150, and we can talk about that later at the end. Um, the member liability is five million, deductible 1,000. Again, uh, we cover participants. Now that's very important. A lot of people argue, what is my liability covering? It's covering the third party. The third party is the innocent party. What happens if I'm on a range and I trip and fall and break my neck and it's not due to my stupidity, somebody at the club left a shovel across the pathway? That's negligence. You can sue the club. So the participants themselves are also covered, okay, for negligent acts. It's very important. I actually got a letter from SRM and I'll read it. What is participant coverage? Participant injury coverage. We're not talking about shooting yourself, okay? So none of that's gonna happen. Participant injury coverage covers lawsuits that may arise from an injury to an individual participating in the activity when the insured is negligent. This is one of the highest exposures in sport and leisure risk today. Okay, you got it. Let's move on. Oh, another thing. This is a business policy, and even in your own personal use, you're looking strictly at the liability there's tenants in the liability for the clubs. Now, there are clubs out there that do not own their own range, and therefore they're occupying someone else's range to shoot. Tenants' legal liability means that if they cause damage to the physical property, up to $1 million is covered, okay? They're a tenant. When they rent a range, they're a tenant. <coughs> Non-owned auto. Now, somebody might say, well, what the heck is non-owned auto? What's it got to do with me as a shooter? Well, Peter, 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 good. Peter, is going to have an AGM this weekend, and he's ordering some pizza, and he tells Ray, Ray, tells Ray, go get a pizza down at the end of the street. Ray goes down to get a pizza, meanwhile he kills two people in his car. Non own auto means that the club will indemnify Ray, his, his insurance company that has to pay the claim, because he was doing an activity for the AGM for the president. Am I right? Good, I got, the, I got everything right. Um, if someone asked the question, is the CSSA program primary? The answer is, what is primary? Does anyone know what primary means? First payer. Right. The answer was first payer. Now, if you're at a range, at a competition, the policy through the CSSA is primary. 
the only time you'll have a discrepancy, it's not a discrepancy, you're still going to be covered, is when there's other coverage that's primary. And a homeowner's policy is primary at the house, and it could be primary while you're hunting. It could be, okay? But remember, what is the limit of liability on a homeowner's policy? One million, maximum, unless you've asked for an umbrella or excess coverage. So I hate to tell you <laughs> how little this policy costs because it's a fraction of what it would cost you if you tried to buy it independently, okay? I had a call the other day and somebody complained to me about a price for another product, it was $200. And I said, sir, I've spent 16 hours with you on the phone. I've sent 10 letters to the insurance company. Um, I, I think you owe me about $3,000 at my hourly rate of 350. He says, well, I'll take the 250 instead. <laughs> yeah. The moral of the story is you cannot buy insurance as individuals as cheap as you can through an association, and that's the value of power, okay? Okay, we've done that. Oh, one last thing. Uh, at, at point number 11, it says, at this AGM, we are now gonna be offering hunters and hunter land lease coverage. So we're endorsing the CGL to in include land leases. So if you have a relationship with a farmer that says you can shoot on his property, you can take your your application for land lease, photocopy it, fill it in, send it to us, and we'll have knowledge that you're given this lease to that landowner. And that means any incidents that you're responsible for on that property would be covered uh, related to your negligence. Yes, sir. So whenever we fill one of those out, you need a copy of it? Yeah, Thank I do. You. And, and, and by the way, from an administration point of view, it's going to go into a filing cabinet. We're not even going to look at it unless there's a claim. No, it's just that I want to make sure that I'm yeah. me filling it out. It's not the only thing that's required. You need a copy of that. Yeah, we need a copy. Uh, remember what I said earlier about occurrences when an event occurs? We have to have proof of documents. Okay, so that's your document. You'll have to forgive me for the presentation because I wanted to cover a lot of things and unfortunately I haven't used PowerPoint in a while, so everything got a little too tight and I know it's hard to see, but uh, we'll get to it. We're now going to talk about the directors and officers because uh, these are the people that are paying the bills to the CSSA and they want to know what they're covered for. So our limit of liability is five million. The named insured is the CSSA directors and officers and CSA club officers and directors for claims made during the policy period, including retroactive date. Now, retroactive date means how long has this policy been in force or prior policies where there's consecutive coverage. It's critical to have consecutive coverage because an occurrence can happen 10 years ago and it only surfaces as a claim today. And uh, I had a call the other day about uh, a, cl a camp and there was children involved, and there was a sexual harassment charge. Now, sexual harassment is an exclusion in most directors and officers' policies, including ours, okay? Um, we may end up paying a claim under the bodily injury portion, but not under the directors and officers. But if the club or your club feels that they want to have sexual harassment, they can just send me an email and we can investigate. I think you should restate that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> coverage, coverage. <laughs> Sorry. Tongue in cheek. <laughs> Sorry. So what does that service cost you? I do. Hang on. I haven't had a coffee. I haven't had a coffee. This is about the sixth coffee that I've had. The last point I've got there is the uh, name directors and officers. A mistake that's being made by a lot of clubs is they're not identifying all their directors and officers and a claim comes in and we say, who's this person? When did he join? Why don't we know about that? Why are we covering him? He's not on the list. So every year you're given an opportunity to identify your directors and officers. If you have an AGM and there's a change of directors and officers, please send it in. Send it to Heather, not me, <laughs> okay? Any questions on that? Directors and officers? Okay. Directors and officers is primarily a financial policy when there's been negligence that causes a financial loss to the uh, club. Uh, we do have wrongful dismissals with employees and employers, and one of the mistakes that's been made is the assumption a volunteer is not an employee. And an example is a person volunteers to cut the grass, in return he gets membership, that's called consideration, and consideration could imply he's an employee. So you could get a wrongful dismissal suit. So literally, coffee and donuts after a work party 
could be considered consideration? Uh, it has to be reasonable. Uh, I can't answer that. Uh, judge, anybody a judge here? <laughs> okay. Uh, you're not drag them in. Uh, actually, I, I, I'm going to deviate just, just for a second to demonstrate how you can mess up, okay, and it's my own situation. I have been in the business long enough to have literally thousands and thousands of clients, and I literally have forgotten thousands and thousands of names. I'll even forget half your names, maybe two quarters. <laughs> what I'm getting at is, 35 years ago, a person bought a policy from me. It was a life insurance policy. And uh, to make a long story short, the guy didn't pay his premiums consecutively. He had a habit of never paying his premiums. Unfortunately, he was not my client. I bought a book of business and inherited it, and I didn't even have a file on the person. 30 years later, I get a letter from the insurance company saying the guy has, for the 10th time, forgot to pay his premiums. His policy has lapsed, and guess what? We're not going to reinstate it. Reinstatement is a very, very uh, controversial topic because if you've owned a policy for 30 years, you put a lot of money into it. And reinstatement means that if you're uh, do it within a certain time period, they'll do it without medical evidence. This person waited 60 days. The waiver on the reinstatement says that he had that opportunity as long as he did it within 60 days. He didn't. So the policies lapsed. They will reinstate, but you have to have medical evidence. So the guy calls me up and says, I understand you're my agent. I said, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I don't know who the hell you are. Excuse my French, but I, uh, it's the truth. I don't know who you are but I will do my best. I phoned the insurance company and of course they gave me their stock reply. We're not doing a thing for this guy. He's done it 10 times in the past. We've got him, we got rid of him. So I phone him back and I say, sir, you know, unless you're prepared to do a medical, we can't reinstate. He says, Ian, I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to try real, real hard. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he says, don't you have duty of care? Duty of care is also part of the board of directors you have a responsibility to protect your membership. In this case, he said something to me that triggered my little brain to immediately call my errors and omissions lawyer. <laughs> and very quickly, and, and I, did a, I did record everything. What happened next kind of floored me. Because in the insurance industry, in the life insurance, and we're on a tangent here, we only get paid in the first few years. So for 30 years, we've not been paid anything on this policy and we've not received any compensation. So I call the lawyer, the e &O lawyer, and he says, to, or she says to me, Ian, I'm sorry, you're guilty. Guilty of failure to provide duty of care. And I said, on what basis? And uh, she said, well, as an agent, or broker in this case, you have a responsibility to protect the interests of your client. Number one priority, not necessarily the company, the client. Uh, did you write him a letter to say you're a dummy, you didn't pay your premiums, and you're gonna lose your coverage? I said, no, I had no file on the guy, I had nothing. I ended up putting the file in the garbage can. I did actually scan it on my computer because I do that today. I then called the insurance company and said, look, I think we got a problem. We're talking a quarter million dollars here. I think you're gonna have to you know, discuss this with your uh, higher paid staff and discuss if we're gonna reinstate. And I knew they shouldn't. I knew they should not reinstate. I went back to the insured and I said, sir, why do you think I have a duty of care? Because I'm a Supreme Court judge. <laughs> ah, okay, let me make one more phone call. <laughs> I went back to the insurance company in 15 minutes, they reinstated the policy. I said, you know good rats to the insurance company because not only have you reinstated somebody that shouldn't be reinstated, I have errors and omissions, I'm prepared. But you now have changed the wording of his policy. Once you change the wording of a policy by doing something that's outside of the scope of the policy, you no longer have a contract, and the contract can be changed at any time. So in this case, he didn't have to pay his premiums anymore. There's no such thing as a 60-day grace period. He could pay at any time he wanted, and it has gone to court. He's a Supreme Court judge. I tend to think he's got... What was his excuse for not paying if any? Ah, uh, he just forgot. Yeah. But, but in fairness, uh, life is like that. And people that know more than you and I are the ones that win. Well, I got that at home. No, no, he was paying, but he was always late. Oh. Okay, he was taking it to the nth degree every time, always late, until finally he was late beyond 60 days. Now, here's the, the twist to the story. I call up my errors and emissions insurance company, and I say, well, look, we got it resolved. I now want to launch a class action suit against the insurance company. And they said, what for? 
I said indenturement. Does anyone know what indenturement means? Slavery. Pardon? Slavery. It's working for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Indenturement was calm and the, the, the Irish came to Canada in the turn of the century because they wanted to get away from the potato famine and to get over here they had to sign on their life that they'd be a, a what do you call it, a, a worker on the ship or whatever. A slave, whatever you want to call it. The point is, indenturement's illegal. And I said, the insurance industry has indentured me to my clients. I'm not being compensated, and I'm indentured for life, for as long as I live, okay? Moral of the story is the board of directors has a duty of care to protect the membership of the club. So you always have to be aware of what's happening in the club and doing the appropriate thing by recording and having policy and procedures and making sure the membership knows about them. Let's, yes? I've got, a, I've got a question. Oh, damn it. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> we were just talking about you. <laughs> well, okay, I snuck in. Now, uh, a question of, about directors and officers. Yes. Because you say it's about negligence. Yes. Okay, here, I'm going to give you a scenario. Oh, okay. It's not one of our insured clubs. Okay. But I was contacted about this. A club made tremendous changes to its um, lay of the land. It removed soil, it added soil, it dug holes, it filled holes. And it got range approval for all these wonderful things. It didn't get any permits to remove or add. It had been informed and had prior meetings with the municipality that they were needed. That club is now looking at about a half a million to a million dollars worth of work orders. In that situation, would that be negligence or, or not? It was deliberate malfeasance. Yes. And would that be on or off the coverage? I'm going to say, I'm not a lawyer, you're a lawyer. I'm not a judge, you're closer to it. My opinion, <laughs> my opinion is it's intentional, it is. and it's, therefore it's not covered. That's what I'm Any other? Questions on that? Well, yes. A subset of what you're, um, that's, you're talking about whether a, a club had insurance coverage for a proper amount for the building. So you had a quarter million dollar building versus a million dollar building. And it would be, be negligent and purposeful that they did not choose the million. They still get covered for the quarter million? Uh, the quarter million insurance policy is still in force, but how it's paid is not replacement value. It'll be an uh, actual cash value. And, you get a quarter and million, the, the issue is. Did the board of directors inform the members that they made that choice? Right. If it was intentionally avoiding the membership for, they didn't want to be uh, scrutinized, mm -hmm. then that's an intentional act. So then the board members are then personally liable? Um, I can't answer that. Okay. But remember this, if you are aware of something and you don't take action, you are negligent. Mm -hmm. If you say to your members, we are not taking action, and here's why you agree with us and will allow us to do that, no problem. But if the membership is not consulted or the board doesn't have the authority to make that decision without going to the membership, then yes, you could be in trouble. Sorry. Uh, the DNO policy, I actually gave you a copy for the directors and officers. Again, it's just the front page. Again, it's 63 pages, and you're welcome to ask me for a copy. Or um, we did have it on the website called CSSAinsurance.com, and in the next six months, you'll be able to go to that site and get any information about any coverages. And we're going to move on because we're running out of time. Okay. okay I'm going to I can't go backwards, but there was one comment there. It said, what happens when you have multiple policies? You're going to have multiple claims. Now, on your incident report form, I left the policy number blank. Because you have your policy with you now, you can put that number in. But if it's a dual policy, meaning that there's more than one insurer involved, put down the other insurer's name and policy number as well when you submit that. So if it was a homeowner as event, and you don't know what the limit of liability is going to be, you would send that incident report to us and have both names on it. And all we're going to do is keep it on file. Unless it says, call me, meaning you. Okay. Oh. 
Okay, there's a, um, what are the claims we're having at the gun clubs? Anybody got any guesses? Oh, I thought that was a hand going up. Yes, sir. Slip and fall. We've had lots of slip and falls. We've had some carelessness. We, uh, we've had uh, buildings collapse and injuries. We've had deaths where people have slipped and fall. We've had accidental shootings. And everybody says, what's the famous saying we all say? Should happen. Should happen. That's true. It ain't going to happen to me. <laughs> That's the other one. The moral of the story is, everybody, uh, in the last 10, 12 years that I've been involved, it's been a really good group of people. And the firearms aren't the issue. Okay, you're a good group of people. Uh, you've done great things uh, for your community, your clubs, your association. But, as was already said, it happens. Poop happens. Okay, I've given you the incident reporting form. We've talked about that. The pyramid of liability. The CSSA is the policy holder, okay? You're the individual or the additional insured or named insured. Right in this case, you're additional insured. And the club is also a named insured or additional insured. Okay, there is a difference, but additional insured means you're part of the master contract. Any questions on that? Okay. Okay, when you do the claim form, make sure you date it, time, incident statement, witnesses. And you, the one last point, and Ed will probably confirm this, you may acknowledge an incident, but don't admit liability. Ed, you're gonna help me on that? Uh, I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're supposed to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'll use this example. I'm Thank gonna you. bring it into the legal sense for a second. You go, into, you, you go home, you've left your car with your gun in it, it's all locked up. Everything's nice. It was just too darn cold, too late that night, and didn't bring gun in. Go out the next morning, cars were broken into, the windows are smashed, and you are, um, let's see, what can I stand to lose? My Remington uh, 700 is gone. I called the police, and I say, this is my duty. I'm reporting that my gun is missing. It has been stolen. And I don't say a damn thing next. Nothing else. In other words, you report the problem. I'm not going to admit that I stored it or didn't store it right. I'm not going to say how it was stored. I'm not going to say if it's loaded or not. I'm just going to do what the law requires. You do what the policy requires. We had an accident. They will investigate. Now, further to that, Ed, I'm sure that when my local police agency shows up, they're going to say, tell us the circumstances and how it went missing. Shut the hell up. Anyway, I don't want to divert from that. Okay, well, Talk to me about okay, that during my discussion. Let's get back to yours. Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very much, Ed. I appreciate that. And, and you know what? Everybody has a guilty conscience sometimes. You want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. The right thing is, as Ed has already mentioned, is report the incident, the circumstances to the, the incident report form. Let the insurance company investigate. Let the police investigate if it's uh, involving a firearm. Uh, keep it simple and let other people determine who's responsible. Because remember, the policy only pays if you're negligent. We'll defend you, we're gonna pay your defense costs, but we don't pay claims unless you're negligent. So unless you're found negligent, we're just gonna be paying defense costs, okay? Um, actually, a comical, co a comical claim. I got a call one day from a club, and it was another club renting another club's property. And the guy calls me up and he says, I wanna make a claim for a BMW. I said, what? He says, my BMW. I parked it at the club, and uh, we had a really windy day, and a tree fell over and hit my car and destroyed my car. So I want to make a claim. I said, oh, really? And uh, who was negligent? God? <laughs> well, to make a long story short, we never paid the claim. But we could have had to pay the claim if that tree was a rotten, dead old tree, and it was on club property. So the moral of the story is, we, we really don't know if there's negligence until we investigate. Uh, we didn't pay in that case. Okay, what other products do we sell for the firearms owner? Well, we've got the private range coverage that's required by the CFO, and I know most people here don't have a private range, but if you know anyone that owns a farm and they shoot on a regular basis, and I don't know if I had the discussion with Ed or Tony or it was the CFO, and the question came, what is the definition of a range on a farm? Anybody know? Yes? Regular use. 
That's the key word. Regular loose, a certain location on the farm. So if you put a target up, you put a stand up, and you use that as your location, that's a range. And you have to have liability according to the CFO. Uh, now, I also talked about uh, instructors, uh, special skill set. There are instructors out there that are doing it commercially. The key word is commercial. Commercial means you're charging for your services. If you're charging for your services as an individual, you're liable, not only for your actions, but the person that you're instructing. So if you don't have liability insurance and your wife doesn't own the house, sorry, you should have your own liability policy, as well as non-owned auto and these others. And we put a package together that's very economical. It's so economical that I don't even like selling it. The bottom line is, if you know anybody that's instructing anything, tactical, skeet, um, I don't want to use hunter safety because that is already covered in their association, but if they have an entity, meaning that they're, they're, they operate as a true company, incorporated, they need to have liability insurance. They even need tenants legal liability if they have an office. Their homeowner's policy won't cover them necessarily. A homeowner's only covers businesses that are incidental. Definition of incidental, your briefcase, your computer, a piece of paper. If it's a home office, you better talk to your insurance company, okay? We offer certificates of insurance when the instructor is charging commercial fees. Non-CSSA safety training, we cover the CSA safety training already under the CGL, but if they're teaching other courses at the club, they should have an, a, a, a policy, especially if they're bringing non-CSSA members onto the club property. Auto and home. Um, I really have to apologize. We've done a lousy job on advertising. If you own a car, if you own a home, if you feel that you'd like to get a discount, we offer a group rate for the CSSA members through a company called Intac, and the subsidiary is called Novex, and uh, we have a number you can call, and they'll give you a quote. It is not a be-all, end-all. We turn down lots of people, but it's not because they own firearms. Okay? So feel free. We have no firearm exclusion. We're familiar with the uh, firearm owner. We know they do reloading. Reloading is not an issue, okay? Some people are afraid to tell their insurance company they do reloading. We don't care. Uh, we do underwrite by risk. So if you have a uh, 1920s fire wood-burning stove in the front living room and it was put there by your grandfather, we'll probably turn you down, okay? And that's about it on that. Health and dental. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, this was brought up by a number of people. We have collectors, sorry. We have collectors, and they have a large number of firearms, and they're afraid to tell their insurance company that they own these. And I'll tell you right now, I have had insurance companies, even Novex, turn down uh, collectors. Because the way they risk, or sorry, the way they rate a risk is they look at the value of your home, and they have a formula. And that formula is that 70% of the value of the home can be content coverage. And when you have a person that has more than the value of the home in firearms, the ratios are all mixed up for the insurance company. It doesn't fit their pattern. So what I'm designing with Tony and, and the association is a, a, a program where firearm owners can actually insure their firearms separately from their homeowners. Two reasons. One is the limits aren't going to be an issue. And two, uh, you don't have to worry about your house being turned down for fire insurance because you own firearms. Okay? And in the United States through the NRA, and I'm mentioning them because there's a good relationship, I believe, Steve, between the NRA and CSSA, and they've had these programs going for a number of years. Um, I've spoken to a few people, and here's some issues that have come up. What's the value of my firearm? Do I have to put a serial number down? Now, if we're talking long gun, you and I are on the same page. We don't want to create a registry. I've had the insurance companies understand that they cannot create a registry by taking serial numbers, so the only way I'm asking them to make this program work is to identify the firearm by make and model, possibly a year, but no serial numbers. And the only purpose of that is so that you don't ask us to make a claim for you have 30 firearms and you only insured one, and you call in every day, well, that one was the one I insured, that was the one I insured, that was the one I insured. We want to know which ones you want insured, so you have to tell us which ones are insured. As far as its market value, uh, we've come up with a really interesting formula, and uh, if, for instance, you bought a brand new firearm, cost you $1,000, we're going to insure it for 1000 
But if you have a firearm that you bought 10 years ago and it's 50% worn on the firing pin, the barrel's got uh, rust or whatever, the patina's gone, you're going to tell us what percentage of wear that firearm has. And then we're going to use that percentage replacement value, a new one, and say that's what we'll insure it for. So you're going to get a fair price for it. And that can change every year. Any questions? Yes. Uh, what about cancellation? I know with uh, home insurer, uh, a home insurance policy happens to my neighbor. Uh, uh, a uh, delivery person went on a property. Their dog uh, bit the uh, person. Uh, he was sued. The insurance company paid and dropped him. Yes. Uh, what about with this? Did well, you make a claim? Are you dropped? First of all, let's do one thing at a time. A homeowner's policy, if it's with the CSSA's group plan, we know that you have firearms. We know we're going to have claims. We statistically know how many people are going to make claims. But if you're a target, I use that word loosely, target. If you're a target, meaning that someone knows you've got firearms and you get robbed every year, no, we're not going to cover you. Nobody will because you're a target. And we do have that happen. We do have that happen. But let's go back to the dog. The reason that person may have, may have been cancelled is the breed of the dog. A lot of insurance companies, the breed, the breed, the type of dog. No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I'm a little disappointed, okay, because a lot of companies have come to me and said, okay, if this guy's got a Doberman, uh, a pit bull, or whatever, we don't no, want him. Okay. The insurance company should not have um, cancelled that person, and there is recourse. There is recourse. And just to prove a point, my wife was cancelled for having one accident in 35 years. Now, the reason she, it was a car accident. Now, let me explain. They're not allowed to do that either. They're not allowed to cancel you for having one accident. Something the public doesn't know when we're on a tangent. Insurance brokers have to have a certain volume of business to get a contract. They also have to have a certain loss ratio. That means how many premiums did you collect and how many dollars did you pay in claims. And if that broker is high, has a loss ratio over 90%, the broker is being canceled, not just the homeowner, okay? And my wife was with a broker that I didn't know. His loss ratio was under question. And he wrote a letter saying that uh, the underwriting rules of the company have changed. We're no longer able to keep you with this company, so get lost. Just so happens they picked the wrong guy. I was a lobbyist in 1994 for the auto industry, the insurance companies and we wanted the government to take it over. So don't ever think the brokers are not on your side. The brokers are on your side. It's the companies, and I'm sorry, I, I, I represent the companies, but I also am what's called duty of care. I've got to protect your rights. And your rights were compromised in that situation. Any other questions? You never answered my question. So I make a claim, you pay the claim, I have another claim, say, in two years. What happens? We're going to put a little note on your file. If he has another one, he's gone. Because something's wrong. And, and let me explain that. Statistically, the question. okay, statistically we know who's going to have a claim. Statistically we know how many claims. And if you fit outside of the statistics, what's going on? And I'll prove a point. I had a client who was in the electronics business. We had two claims for half a million in two years. The third time, we didn't pay the claim. And the reason is the investigating officer found he had his inventory still in his shop that he claimed. Yeah. Okay? So, yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying you're a crook. I'm saying... Not that, yet. No, you're not saying <laughs> what we're saying is... Remember what I said earlier? It's a partnership. Remember that word. It's a partnership. If you're not my partner, I don't want to deal with you. Okay? We have an agreement. And the agreement is you're going to do diligence. You're going to protect your firearms. You're going to do the best you can. And by the way, uh, this issue came up with reloading. Uh, I was calling an insurance company up about reloading. They didn't want to do a reloader. I said, do you understand what a reloader is? Do you understand what the law is regarding reloading? Do you understand that the fire department is okay reloading? After about an hour explaining reloading to them and how it's done and how it's stored, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they said, cheesy, and there's no risk here at all. Just make sure that the underwriter I talked to that day has been told what you told me. Okay? So that answers your question. If you're a, a prudent firearm owner, a safe firearm owner, a member of the CSSA, I will protect your rights. Okay? And then Ed will come second. <laughs> he, can, he can sue the company. Um, we do have a website for insurance information for the CSSA. It's called CSSAinsurance.com. Please don't go to it and say it doesn't look pretty. 
It's under construction. It's been that way for five years, by the way. <laughs> oh, uh, anybody travel competitions outside of Canada? Okay. I got a call about uh, six months ago, and a fellow called me up and says, Ian, I'm going down to Vegas. I'm going for competition. I've just been turned down for travel insurance. I said, what? He said, Blue Cross, I mentioned that name only once, had said, we don't cover uh, hazardous activities. I said, first of all, they're wrong. And it's not an exclusion on the policy. You're covered. But if you're concerned, I will write you up a policy and give you a letter and a warranty that you're covered for firearm use in a competition, as long as it's not a competition where it's your main source of income. How about that kid? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if you have a, a club, you want to get a, a, an idea of what proper insurance you should have on the building, et cetera, et cetera, uh, please call me. You don't have to buy it from me, but I can give you some guidance, okay? I, I don't have a lot of time, but if you give me the facts, what you have, what you're looking for, and your circumstances, I'll say, here's what you should be looking for, okay? Special event. Believe it or not, not every single darn thing at the club is covered. If you're having bar mitzvahs and everything like that at your club, please tell us and make sure that that person has an event policy. Because we're covering the club for firearm activities. What the heck does that party have to do with the firearm activity? And you're doing it for rent, I assume. Liquor liability. We cover liquor liability only if it's related to an AGM at your club. If you have a restaurant and you're serving liquor, then you have to have a separate policy. Oh, <laughs> golf hole in one coverage. What the heck are we talking about? I thought it was guns. Hole in one coverage. Believe it or not, a lot of clubs want to raise money, fundraising, and they have a golf tournament as well as a firearms event. Call me, we do hole in one coverage. If you can think of an event, and we're not going to do turkey shoots, okay? They're already understood that you're going to get that turkey. <laughs> Sorry, the target. Um, we're going to write a book for you. It's called The Firearm, Firearm Owner's Guide to Insurance Handout. I've started to hand out things today. We're eventually going to have a little booklet for you so you can carry it with you and it says page one, screen, help. You know, that type of thing. Thank you, CSA directors and office and members. Okay, so you know how to contact me. I'm going to play a little soundtrack right now. I'm finished. Oh, I'm sorry, I carried over. I wanted to talk about cyber liability and Bill 150. Bill 150, if you're not aware of it, has to do with the Privacy Act. And as a club, you are required to have a policy and procedure as to what action you will take in the event your database is compromised. If you do not have a program under Bill 150, you can be fined up to $100,000 in an event. Uh, and, and you can read about this Bill 150. I just found out about it because I was sent this because I have a database. And it's enforced as of November 15th. Now I'm going to play you a little video. You aren't going to be able to see the video, but you're going to be able to hear it. And it's all about artificial intelligence. And if you bear with me, you uh, may find it very interesting. Starting this year, Toyota and Lexus luxury models will come with Amazon Alexa. Alexa, turn on the AC. Turning on AC. Finally, a virtual assistant to help you navigate. Alexa, where's the nearest gas station? Nearest gas station in 1.5 miles. And to help maintain your vehicle. Alexa, order more brake pads. Ordering new brake pads, although maybe if you didn't stop so close to the car in front of you. I left plenty of room. You drive too aggressively. If you were just quiet for two seconds, two seconds. She'll talk to you literally the entire time you're driving. I think you should have turned back there. I know where I'm going! <laughs> Hi. You know why I pulled you over? No, officer. I have... Because we were driving 72 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone. Anything else I should know? Two miles back, we rolled through a stop sign without coming to a complete stop. Also, there are illegal fireworks in the truck. <laughs> Amazon Alexa. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that is artificial intelligence at its best. Uh, but I mention it only because I tend to like artificial intelligence, and uh, I have an Alexa in my home, and I have a Google Home as well. And even though it does invade my privacy, I have a mother that's 94 years old in an old folks' home, and she sometimes wakes up in the middle of the night and disoriented, and all she does is she says, Alexa, where am I? Alexa, what time is it? 
Alexa call Ian. The moral of the story is it's helped certain people and it's a godsend. On the other hand, your privacy is invaded. The impact it's gonna have on us is gonna be monumental. Ed, do you have any comments on that? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Please feel free to ask questions. And